Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the February 5th, 2018 edition of the Weekly Top 3, our weekly 15-minute-ish podcast covering, covering the top three things on our mind as we make the turn from the past week to the week ahead. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you can keep track of news and our commentary on these and other issues which we believe have a material impact on Alaska's fiscal and economic condition through our, fisc our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, through our posts on Twitter, Twitter. Again, our account is Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can also find this and past episodes of the weekly top three on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. This week, our top three, the top three issues we're following and we want to talk about here are these. First, a piece by GCI Chairman Ron Duncan on Alaska's fiscal condition, but really just another plea by him for cutting the PFD. Second, our thoughts on a bill currently making its way through the Alaska legislature to early fund education. And third, a new bill in the legislature to raise oil taxes. The first thing on our mind this week is an op-ed piece by Ron Duncan, the chairman of GCI, uh, that appeared in the Anchorage Daily News Sunday edition, uh, but which is a reprint, a shortened reprint of a speech he gave uh, to the Economic Alaska Anchorage Economic Development Corporation uh, economic forecast lunch earlier in the week. The title of the piece uh, is this, the lack of action on Alaska's fiscal crisis is destroying confidence and stifling our economy. And it is essentially a repeat of the argument that Duncan and others uh, have made along the way that Alaska's economy is suffering because of the lack of a decision uh, by state government about how it's going to fund itself. And the concern is, and, and, the, and the thesis is that industry and others are sitting on the sidelines waiting to invest in Alaska, invest more in Alaska, uh, until they it, until they see how the legislature is going to deal with the fiscal crisis, they're concerned. They don't want to invest more in Alaska uh, until um, until they know who's going to be taxed or how those revenues are going to be raised. The irony of this particular piece is that Duncan spends most of the piece uh, talking about what great what a great future Alaska has because of investments <laughs> that are being made on the North Slope by the oil industry. So that argument undercuts his thesis from the outset uh, by uh, admitting that investments on the North Slope are going forward, uh, major investments on the North Slope are going forward in the oil industry, uh, even though Alaska does not yet have its uh, fiscal house in order. But the more important part of the piece uh, and of Duncan's argument uh, is toward the end of the piece when he talks about how he would how he would uh, fix this fiscal problem. The last paragraph says, or the next to last paragraph says, if we start to fix the fiscal problem by making sustainable draws from the earnings reserve before we run out of savings, I believe that confidence in the private sector will come back very rapidly and you'll see a quick rebound in that missing investment. Again, this is in the context of having spent most of the speech talking about investments that are being made on the North Slope. But he says, in that missing investment, this will be followed very, very shortly by increased employment and a return to growth. There is no reason why we can't be growing as fast or faster uh, than the rest of the world. Well, when you bore down through what, what Duncan's argument really is, uh, it's not so much about spending from the permanent fund earnings as it is cutting the PFD. What he wants to do is to fund government uh, by taking the portion of the permanent fund earnings that Governor Hammond envisioned, the 50% of the, of the permanent fund earnings that Governor Hammond envisioned being available for government uh, to fund essential uh, services when uh, oil was no longer sufficient to do so, and take some of the PFD, uh, an additional portion of the permanent fund earnings, uh, out of the PFD to help fund government uh, itself. The problem with that, the problem with that solution is cutting the PFD is the very solution that ICER's uh, 2016 economic analysis uh, of the state's various fiscal options says 
quote, has the largest adverse impact, close quote, on the overall economy and is, quote, by far the costliest to Alaska families, close quote, of all the various fiscal options uh, that are available to the state, new revenue options that are available to the state to deal with the current uh, economic situation. So what Duncan is arguing is essentially we need to fix the economy by hurting the economy more, by, by doing the very things that have the, quote, largest adverse impact, uh, close quote, on jobs and income, and, and quote, have by far the, co or by far the costliest uh, measure for Alaska families, close quote, close quote, of all the options. Now, the reason Duncan argues that is because it benefits him and others uh, in the upper income bracket. It maintains, it provides revenue to maintain uh, government spending at elevated uh, levels, but without burdening the upper 20% that, that Ron and, and his peers are in with some of the costs. It shifts the, through PFD costs, through PFD cuts, it shifts the bulk of the cost of paying for that elevated government spending off on the remaining 80% and, and leaves the, the upper 20% really without bearing a significant burden uh, with respect to those costs. So yes, it makes his economic situation better. It helps fund, it helps, ele it hel helps maintain government spending that is in part directed toward GCI uh, uh, to pay for telecommunications uh, out in the bush and other things. And it does so without burdening him uh, and others in his income bracket uh, uh, without paying, uh, for not paying, not paying a share of the costs. But it does so with the, at the largest, uh, with the largest adverse effect uh, on the overall income and by far the costliest uh, to Alaska families. It is sort of like we have to go out and shoot the economy to save it. Yes, we're saving the portion of the economy that Ron is in. I understand why he favors that. But we're shooting the overall economy uh, in order to save him. Frankly, we just find this continuing argument that we see from Duncan and others both disingenuous and self-serving. Disingenuous because we are, in fact, seeing investment in this state on the North Slope. All you have to do is read Duncan's piece uh, in order to find a litany of what that investment is that's going on up on the North Slope. And second, self-serving, because yes, he's arguing to save the economy, but it's the portion of the economy uh, that's benef that benefits him. It's not the overall economy. Alaska does need a fiscal solution, but we need a fiscal solution that is driven by doing what's best for the overall economy doing what's best for all Alaska families, not simply carving out one share of the economy or one set of, of taxpayers and say, hey, we're going to do something that benefits them, even if it is at the uh, adverse impact to the overall economy. We need to be looking out for the overall economy and adopting uh, a solution that addresses that first. The second thing we're following as we make the turn from the week past to the week ahead are two bills in the legislature uh, dealing with early funding of education. One is in the House by Representative Paul Seaton, authored by Representative Paul Seaton. The second is in the Senate, uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Gary uh, Stevens. The gist of the bills are to move uh, funding for education up early in the session in advance of the rest of the budget. Uh, and pass bills that fund education uh, before dealing with uh, the remainder of the budget, frankly, either on the spending or uh, on the revenue side. Both bills are uh, strongly supported by education interests, basically arguing that uh, they need these early funding bills so that they don't get stuck at the end of the session not knowing whether and, and to what extent that the education's K through 12 is going to be funded, uh, and as a result, issuing pink slips and doing other things toward the end of their fiscal year uh, while they wait on the legislature to sort out uh, the overall uh, budget. 
for those interested uh, on, in these bills, good articles on them in Matt Bugs Buxton's uh, blog, uh, The Midnight Sun, both a detailed article on the bills plus uh, updates. Our problem with the bills is that they start to piecemeal uh, the way in which the state's addre uh, addressing its costs. Uh, we need a total fiscal solution to the state, not one that comes in dribs and, br and drabs and locks in a piece of the overall fiscal picture before we get to the end uh, and deal with the overall picture. K through 12 funding is about 25 percent uh, of the operating budget, about 1.3 uh, billion dollars. Uh, if you lock that in early and take that off the table, uh, it leaves very few other options or it limits your options with, re with remainder of the budget about how you're going to achieve your fiscal objectives. Last year, the legislature claims that they spent about $4.3 billion uh, in overall unrestricted general fund spending. Uh, this year, uh, making the, uh, the governor's proposal, making the adjustments that we've talked about in pre previous episodes, the proposal in front of the legislature is about $4.8 billion, uh, some $400 to $500 million, depending upon how you do rounding, uh, higher than last year's uh, spending level. Last year, you'll recall, the Senate said, we're going to spend $4.3 billion, and we're going to make further cuts uh, even from that. The governor has moved the goalpost out to $4.8 billion, so you need to cut $400 to $500 million out of that $4.8 billion just to get back to, to last year's level, much less uh, start making additional cuts. So if you start locking in portions of the budget early, if you lock in 25% of your budget early, you're starting to tie your hands behind your back uh, in how you're going to deal with, uh, with the overall fiscal situation. We're not necessarily advocating cutting K through 12, although frankly, as part of an overall solution, we do think that, uh, that we're going to have to go back into things, the formula programs like the BSA and, and, and look at ways to sque squeeze those costs down uh, and make them more efficient. But even if you assume K through 12 funding is going to be off the table, you still don't want to lock in that spending early. When you get down to the end of the legislative session, there's horse trading, there's trade-offs that go on. There are going to be advocates for fully funding K through 12, funding it at a, at a, at a robust level. Um, and there are going to be advocates that want to, you know, uh, fund other things and make, or, and or make cuts other places. If you've locked in K through 12, the advocates of, of K through 12, when you get to the final process, the advocates of K through 12 don't have to worry about cuts to it. So, so they don't have to worry about horse trading other things uh, in order to get K through 12 funding. They can just go ahead and argue, oh, you need to make cuts here, you need to add additional spending there without any concern about, uh, about or any need to compromise on those other things in order to get K through 12 fully funded. We just think it, it, it's a major error to take 25% of the operating budget off the board early, lock it in and take it off the board early when you're trying to get an overall fiscal solution. We would say the same thing about anything, uh, oil tax credits, anything uh, that people are trying to lock in early. It's a part of the whole fiscal picture of the state and needs to be addressed as part of the whole fiscal picture of the state, as opposed to given some special uh, super status as we go into finding the final fiscal solution. The final issue that makes uh, the cut of the top three this week is a proposal that's in the House uh, to increase oil taxes uh, by Representatives uh, Gar and Josephson. Uh, in a way, increase the minimum rate for oil taxes in a way that uh, would raise about another $255 million uh, for the budget. The debate uh, last week on this was predictable. Uh, Representative Gar, Representatives Gar and, and Josephson essentially said, look, we need more money for the budget. The industry is doing uh, uh, okay, uh, and so we need to look to industry to raise additional funds. The industry came back uh, in their response and said, "Well, if you raise, if you raise these, all heck, heck is going to break loose. Uh, uh, we're going to, you know, reduce uh, funding for projects. The Alaska will be viewed as irresponsible, and 
and uh, uh, untrustworthy in terms of uh, being an investment partner with the oil industry. Uh, and, uh, and all of this progress we've seen on the slope will suddenly fall away. The, the predictable extremes on both sides of the issue. Frankly, we think this issue uh, is premature. Uh, oil taxes ought to be set at the rate, uh, at, 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 the, at, at the optimum rate, and that is the maximum rate at which you can tax and extract money from the industry without slowing down investment. Uh, uh, it's the rate at which Alaska uh, remains competitive, not super competitive, so that uh, so that we're leaving money on the table, but not so, but not raising taxes to such a high level that we're not competitive uh, and pushing investment elsewhere. Looking for that sweet spot, uh, the point, uh, the maximum point that you can tax without losing investment. Looking for that sweet spot is always the debate that we ought to have. Uh, about taxes and is always the core of the debate we ought to have about taxes. And saying we have a, a budget crunch and so we need to call on the industry for more money uh, from the state standpoint is sort of silly and for the industry to always have these reactions about, well, if you do this, the world's going to come to an end uh, is always sort of silly. The legislature has hired some consultants that are supposedly looking at this issue and supposedly at some point this session are going to provide uh, their analysis uh, with respect to where Alaska sits in the competitive uh, structure and uh, their analysis of, of changes that can be made that would make Alaska more competitive, attract more investment, uh, or uh, danger areas where if we did this, we would attract uh, less investment. All of this debate about raising the minimum rate or anything else uh, is premature until We've had a chance to listen to those um, uh, experts uh, take on their advice, analyze it, think about it, uh, and then come to some uh, analysis of whether or not it's time to change taxes, and if so, uh, how to change those taxes. Uh, the rest of it is just sort of a wasted debate. Well, that brings us to the end, and that's a wrap uh, for this week's edition of the Weekly Top 3. Thank you again for joining us this week. Remember that you can find past episodes on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and that you can keep track of us during the week for news and commentary uh, on these issues and others as they develop during the week on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week. Thank you for joining us this week.